Good afternoon. My name is Michael Collins, and I'm the Director General of the IIEA here in Dublin. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this IIEA webinar, which is part of the Institute's Global Europe project, which is supported by the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs. We're delighted to be joined today by Kirsty Calulade, President of the Republic of Estonia from 2016 to 2021. In fact, yesterday was the president's last day in office, and we're gratified indeed that she is available to be with us here today at the IIEA. President Calulate will speak to us about Estonia's Security Council membership, and particularly Estonia's presidency of the council most recently in June of this year. The president will speak to us for about 15, 20 minutes, and then we will move into the Q&A session with you, our audience, both of these sessions will be on the record. You'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom in the usual way, which you should see on your screen. And please do feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you. And we will come to them once we come to the question and answer part of this meeting. Please also feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. As I said, Kirsty Calulade was elected as president of the Republic of Estonia in 2016. She was the first woman to have served as president of Estonia and indeed the youngest person ever to hold this position in her country. She previously served as a member of the European Court of Auditors, advising Prime Minister Mart Lahr and holding different top level positions in energy, investment banking and the telecom sectors. A genetic engineer and economist by education and training, she has been a member of the supervisory board of the Estonian Genome Centre and the council chair of the University of Tartu from 2012 to 2016. So with that, President, you're very, very welcome to the IAEA. The floor is yours. Thank you uh, for inviting me indeed. And let me first congratulate Ireland for your successful and very well organized uh, Security Council presidency in September. The Irish team in New York did an excellent job. Uh, I would like to really thank your ambassador, Mrs. Geraldine byron Nelson, and political coordinator, Mr. Martin Gallagher. You had great signature events. I would especially like to highlight uh, the high level open debate on climate and security on 23rd of September because uh, it was very timely as we were leading up to COP26 in Glasgow. Now turning to the topic of uh, Estonian Security Council June presidency, this was our second United Nations Security Council presidency ever, and uh, probably the last before 2050 when Estonia hopes to join the Security Council uh, once again. How will that uh, project go? We never know. As you may remember, last time we actually uh, had a competition to join the Security Council. And even if it was, uh, I would say, expensive and tiresome campaign, which I led myself, I have to say that we probably did a much better work on understanding the whole world, each and every nation who belongs to the United Nations, because we had competition and we were forced to race to the line to the second round of voting. So I'd really like to thank also competitor Romania for helping us to make sure that we were all for two years during all the active campaign phase on our tiptoes and making sure we know really what this is about. So our presidency, it was guided by our five core priorities uh, in Security Council for 2021, world order based on common rules and international law, protection of fundamental values, including human rights and human dignity, conflict prevention, increasing awareness among Security Council members on the applicability of international law and cybersecurity norms. As you know, Estonia strongly supports the worldview that analog legal space fully applies in cyberspace as well. And all academic analysis and declarations by a few, uh, few nations globally of how they see international law and for that matter, national law to apply in cyber conflicts all proves that we should, should simply take our analog law and apply in, uh, in cybersecurity. For Estonia, the aspects of international law and its uh, formation that are essentially linked to the birth of the Republic of Estonia and the right to self-determination hold particular importance. 
and it is crucial to follow um, the policy of non-recognition when it comes to illegal occupations and annexations. For us, this has to be one of the guiding principles for our stay in Security Council. It's natural. Estonia, when we rejoined uh, the free world 30 years ago, actually was pulled out of our occupation by the bootstraps of non-recognition policy. And even, I mean, nowadays I see very strong parallels that, I mean, sometimes, particularly here in Europe, people get impatient about, for example, situations in Ossetia and, and, uh, and uh, Crimean Peninsula. And we have to remind ourselves that Baltic states were occupied by 50 years. And all this time, our occupation was not recognized and that helped us 50 years later. So strategic patience is something which we always advocate for. And fifth, limiting veto rights in situations that concern genocide or other crimes against humanity. We really consider it that very important for the international community to condemn crimes that are motivated by anti-humanitarian ideologies and committed by criminal regimes. So this is the strategic framework of Estonian UN Security Council stay. June was an extremely busy month in terms of the agenda. We held 45 meetings. In addition, an informal interactive dialogue, seven discussions took place under any other business, and 11 meetings of the subsidiary bodies of the Security Council were held. In June, our, uh, our priorities were human rights. We emphasized the inseparable link between human rights and peace, security, conflict prevention. And on 28th of June, we held a virtual high-level open debate on children and armed conflict, which I had the honor to chair. The objective of the meeting was to focus on the main developments and concerns related to children affected by armed conflict from 2020 and the impact uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic. The briefers were Secretary General Gutierrez, Mrs. Enretta Four, Mr. Forrest Wittak and Mr. Laban Onisimus. For me, it was a, a particularly moving, moving meeting uh, and I would really like to share with you one element which was not on, on the meeting but actually took place before it. I forgot my papers on the meeting, namely Secretary General's report on children in conflict in my car and my 12 year young son read it and uh, he's fluent in English and French and he read it and, uh, and he got really, really thinking and asked me this question that shouldn't we share more with children and teenagers what UN is doing in a simple work, in simply written papers, shorter than that one was, so that children in the first world, children in developed nations would know what is going on and what we have to discuss, what we have to discuss. It would help to sensitize the young generation uh, and also it would help them to recognize and the privilege of their own situation. So it was very interesting for me to see how you really should work more and maybe as a as a uh, uh, global advocate for women and children, I, I need to take this thought of my own son forward. I think it's important. So back to the agenda, cybersecurity. We held the first ever high level open debate and sent an important message that the Council takes cyber threats seriously and takes it even more seriously after it last year uh, already in March, in our, on our insistence, we insisted that Security Council uh, will discuss the cyber attack against Georgia last year. And UK and US uh, supported us in this uh, attempt to have an, any other business meeting we had. And, uh, and, uh, and it was indeed first time ever Security Council dealt with a cyber attack. This cyber attack had the criteria that it was linked to a conflict, which is anyway under the monitoring of the Security Council. So it was easy to create the link and, and, and start creating case law that Security Council has to deal in cyber matters. We were able to have also an ARIA meeting last year, which then all together led to this, uh, this year's presidency's high level open debate, which was the first ever official um, discussion on cyber in Security Council. The meeting was chaired by our prime minister and uh, for us, this was something which we promised in our campaign to our electorate. We will bring cyber matters to security council. And some thought we cannot do it because, because uh, there had been numerous open-ended working groups and so on, so on, debating these issues. Yet we found a way and, and I, would, I would advise that uh, 
this is why the small, small mobile member states are elected to the Security Council, that they can find different ways and means to bring uh, items on the agenda within the fully, fully uh, in the Security Council rules and regulations. But we are maybe a little bit more opportunistic. So this way, we, we were able to fulfill our campaign promise and then this official discussion kind of um, closed uh, our work on uh, Security Council through two years on cyber issues. We hope that uh, our partners and allies will now carry it on. Where I see the biggest need is that everything which we have uh, now been discussing has related to the, uh, to the uh, conventional conflicts and the conflicts which therefore had a cyber element in it. But I think one day we should also be able to discuss uh, cyber conflicts which do not belong to any, any uh, conventional conflict we are discussing. And why I think so, cyber hostilities very often show relations getting somehow bad between different parties. And therefore, I mean, taking uh, uh, first and strong recognition of cyber attacks may actually help us in our peace building attempts because they do precede very often in our day's world, the real life hostilities. Now to Afghanistan. In 2021, Estonia and Norway together are pen holders of the Afghanistan file, including the UNAMA mandate in the Security Council. And in light of the concerning security situation and volatile uh, political and peace process developments, we decided to hold a quarterly Security Council Afghanistan meeting in the format of a high level debate. It was done on June 22nd, chaired by our foreign minister, Mrs. Eva Maria Limerts. And preceding to that meeting early in spring, I myself visited Afghanistan. Uh, and, and it so happens that uh, it was just before the final withdrawal of, of US troops. So I was the last EU, uh, NATO, or for that matter, um, Security Council uh, uh, member states uh, head who was able to talk to the then government still in office. And I have to say that nothing which they said to us uh, uh, indicated clearly what was to come. So we now are grappling with, with, the, uh, with the devastating effect of that uh, miscalculation globally. Cooperation between the UN and regional organizations, uh, European Union on 10, 10th of June, we organized a briefing on the cooperation between the United Nations and the European Union, highlighting the increasingly important cooperation between the two organizations on international peace and security. And we invited for that meeting High Representative uh, Joseph Borrell to brief the Security Council. We also had together with uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines uh, uh, working methods uh, of the UN Security Council discussion on 16th of June. We organized the annual open debate on the working methods of the Security Council on the theme, agility and innovation lessons from the future from the COVID-19 pandemic. For the last three years, this debate has been the only occasion where the 10 elected members have agreed on a joint statement. And this year it was delivered by the representative of Kenya in his capacity as coordinator for the month of June for the 10 elected members of the council. We're very grateful for that work. In June, the Council also discussed other acute topics like Yemen, Tigray, Myanmar and humanitarian situation in Syria. For us, another important topic was also in June that uh, France and Estonia are pen holders in the UN Security Council on EU Operation Irini. On the first open meeting of our presidency in June, we adopted Resolution 2578. This allows offshore inspections and port diversions of vessels suspected of breaches of the UN arms embargo on Libya. This is an important step as the resolution represents the basis of the core task of Operation Uniform Med, Irini. And it shows the will of the international community to preserve the legal framework aimed at preventing the illicit trafficking of arms to and from Libya in the common effort to bring peace and stability to the country. I had also the chance to uh, visit the UNAF for a uh, uh, mission quite soon after the resolution adoption and uh, and they were very, uh, very, very grateful for the work done, but also said that we need to work more on the public uh, opinion on this because quite a lot of people expect them not to deal with illicit trafficking of arms, but actually uh, take more policing mission on the on the Mediterranean, which also might concern migration then. 
Estonia had also the honor to guide the discussions uh, of the election and the appointment of the Secretary General in the Security Council. On 8th of June, the uh, Council adopted a resolution and recommended that, uh, that um, General Assembly appoint him for another five years, starting 1st of January 2022. I'm very happy that we were uh, part of that process to reappoint my good friend Antonio Gutierrez and again. We cooperated with EU members of the Security Council also on the, on the uh, working methods, the presidencies of Estonia in June, France in July, and, and you then in September, we adopted together a common working methods paper, highlighting elements that we find important, including the need to involve more civil society briefers in uh, Council's meeting. As a horizontal priority for all meetings during our presidency, we aim to include civil society briefers, in particular women uh, civil society briefers, in the Security Council meetings, considering that the civil society often gives an early warning on serious human rights violations and escalation of uh, violence. We had eight civil society briefers, six of them were women, during our meetings on MINUSMA, Yemen, Syria, political, Syria humanitarian, you miss and the high level meetings on Afghanistan and on children and armed conflict. And uh, on the happy note, June was also the first full month since the pandemic started that the Council was back in the chamber for all its meetings, except the three high level events which were held in VTC. And, and I have to say that VTC high level events, uh, I, I have a nudging suspicion that if we continue sometimes doing them this way, we can have a higher level participation, which, which might, might be an event to con element to consider for the future. Even if we can, can come together, why not to preserve at least hybrid meetings? And, uh, and I'm quite, uh, quite sure that this is, this is something which will make UN work uh, in the future as well. Uh. Uh, in, in the future as well, more efficient. And finally, thanks for Ireland participating at high level at all of our main events. Debate on Afghanistan, His Excellency Mr. Simon Coveney, Minister for Foreign Affairs and Defence, 28th June, His Excellency Mr. Michal de Higgins, President, and 29th of June, Cybersecurity, His Excellency Mr. Michal Martin, uh, Prime Minister. So uh, thank you, Ireland, uh, for helping us through our second presidency in the Security Council. And I would here uh, end uh, my longish speech, but the month indeed was busy and, uh, and I tried to put you in the picture. I would be very open to share with you all the, uh, all the feelings, emotions uh, as, as well, uh, not only the, the facts about meetings. I mean, how a small country, first time ever in Security Council, uh, uh, works and, and also an important element which we didn't think ahead, but which became more and more important uh, during our stay and still is important here in Estonia, is to answer the question why you are there. And, uh, and if you want, uh, and if you prompt me, I would, I would really like to a little bit dwell on that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, President, for a, um, a great presentation. Um, uh, can, can I just, uh, while we're um, just encouraging people to send in their questions, um, it, in, in, in Estonia itself, I mean, to what extent is, has um, Estonia's uh, membership of the Security Council, presidency of the Security Council, has it been a, an issue of, uh, you know, of, of, of popular appreciation? I mean, is there a widespread appreciation of the role uh, that the uh, that the Security Council membership gives to um, uh, to Estonia, and what's the level of popular support for what you've been doing? Mm, it's varied. Mm, we've had to um, during the campaign phase. It was very easy to explain why we are campaigning to join the Security Council because all through this campaign, I made sure that we involved the Estonian business delegations and and we we kind of broadened our. Uh, our network globally also to the benefit of, uh, of Estonian society. And everybody understood that, uh, okay, this Security Council is an obscure thing. We don't think about it daily, but at least this campaign is doing something positive for Estonia. Then, as I said, it was a contested seat, which means that, I mean, when we won, then I would say that, uh, well, my press office uh, at the day said to me that con congratulations, Madam President, the weekend is all yours because the World Rally Championships is not on this weekend and Rot Tanak is not driving, so, so the weekend is yours. So Estonians really followed this vote and followed this as a sportive event. 
And, and this, of course, was really a big thing. We won. We got into the Security Council. And then, of course, was a half year of preparation time when, uh, when it was relatively calm. And as soon as we went, then joined, you know, if you are a small country, uh, we are elected because we are stickers to international law, uh, law and stickers to our value-based value foreign policy. And, and we are pretty vocal about these values and, and all this. But once you are behind the Security Council table, you have to make compromises. And you have to talk about the subjects and topics where, I mean, taking a very strong uh, conditional stance does not help you very much forward. For example, if you look at the current situation in Afghanistan, then we first need to make sure that we stabilize the situation, that UN missions could continue to feed the population. And thereafter, we have to start looking at about how we could negotiate in a more conditional way to make sure that, I mean, also the rights of women and children in Afghanistan are protected. But of course, our society wants everything at all, at once. And since we have been always, I mean, if you're out of the discussions, it's very easy to kind of say we, we need and we should do these things. As soon as you are in, your people ask you, why are you even talking to these people? And this has been an, uh, an interesting revelation, I believe, for Estonian uh, foreign policy uh, uh, dealers, including myself, including our minister, including all our ambassadors, that we have to do much more explaining inside the country why we are doing these things. Uh, to the extent that people say, I mean, it's tough. You might make some of our partners and allies angry because you sometimes have also to take a stance against them. And I have, uh, I have been explaining it to our people this way, that, you know, international laws, previous agreements and all these, we, our role in Security Council, elected members, is to stick to these principles, stick to these previous agreements. But we all know that the big movers globally sometimes step a little bit aside of this framework in order to try new avenues of finding solutions. And this is their role in this game. And nobody, none of our partners and allies expects us to, I mean, forget this concrete trail of events, uh, forget uh, to forget what this, I mean, has been agreed previously and how we stick to it. So everybody understands if you are always relying on the previous agreements and international law, and nobody among our partners and allies, why they might be a little bit more adventurous, holds it against you. Uh, I hope Estonian people are understanding these nuances. And, and, and it's been an interesting uh, uh, interaction between our own people. And the last question, finally, which is the weirdest of all, which I absolutely didn't think we will have to deal with. But, uh, you know, Estonia, as soon as we regained our independence, it took us only two or three years before we started, I think three, finally, when we went to the first international military mission, which was Bosnia and Herzegovina EU mission. Thereafter, we've been part of various UN and NATO missions, some of them really deadly, like in Afghanistan, Estonia is one of the, uh, one of the, one of those who lost per capita most, most of the lives. And people have accepted all this. And now when we are actually doing the same work, but in a diplomatic environment, taking our responsibility for international world order behind the diplomatic table, even if it's the most difficult globally, people question that. Why do you do it? And we had to indeed draw the parallel that our, our diplomats are in a similar way, I mean, in the same mission, like our, our, our militaries in the international peacekeeping and, and, and NATO and EU missions. It was interesting, but we were more accepting of the military participation for world peace than diplomatic. But we've had all these debates now, and I believe that overall Estonian people, if they are asked about what they think about Security Council presence, they're proud of it. Excellent, yeah. Um, you live in a neighborhood, obviously, where the overwhelming presence of, of Russia is, is, is so evident. Uh, to what extent, um, as a member of the Security Council and indeed during your two presidencies of the Security Council, uh, was there the possibility to engage uh, constructively with your, with your Russian neighbors, or of course, who are permanent members of the Security Council? We've been also not in the context of Security Council during my presidency, constructively engaging with Russian leadership. I myself uh, been to Moscow to speak to President Putin, where, by the way, he was quite favorable ab about our then ongoing campaign for the Security Council. And, and I believe they also looked with, uh, with certain interest on uh, what we were up to and what were our uh, approaches. 
And of course, uh, they've, been, they've been doing what we have been expecting when we discussed Belarus and Abyssinia in the Security Council all through two years, Belarus, Ukraine, Georgia. Uh, so uh, it's, it's always tough. And, uh, and, and, and of course, we all realize that there are no quick solutions, but, uh, but I cannot say that it has been unconstructed. And that has been, for me, the greatest, uh, the greatest revelation that in the United Nations Security Council, we're able to deliver and accept very different, different viewpoints and, and then gradually move on and hope that we could achieve something. Of course, sometimes it also makes you impatient because we are everybody's in their in the, in their I mean on their own bench of the river and and we never swim across. So uh, you cannot you cannot say that this is the most constructive area probably in in, uh, in foreign policy and diplomacy globally. So it has been uh, it has been let's say constructive and warm, but uh, but not uh, not extremely fruitful cooperation. And to what extent would you? Um... Obviously, these great initiatives, the, this, this great um, uh, priority that, that Estonia has given to its membership of the Security Council and the five core priorities that you identified, to what extent would you be uh, concerned that having you know, moved forward on, on these issues, including in the area of cybersecurity, uh, to what extent would you uh, be concerned that these, uh, about the, the longevity of these initiatives? In other words, uh, will they have an enduring impact or once... Uh, <laughs> The concern would be, I suppose, once Estonia leaves the chair and leaves the council, that some other presidency is going to come in, some other council member is going to come in, they'd have a different set of priorities. And it'd be really hard to maintain the momentum of progress that you will have achieved over the last 18 months. Well, considering how many countries are, are gradually moving, and particularly in the pandemic, it was obvious that countries are moving their uh, public services offer online more and more. And therefore, actually, the interaction between any state, and it's not even developed states only, it also concerns middle-income countries, any state and its link to its citizens can nowadays be easily broken by cyber means. And you can protect yourself indeed. You have to make sure that your people have a certain level of cyber hygiene. You have to make sure that your systems are constantly up to date and renewed and, and you monitor constantly their safety and security. But finally, things go wrong. You have to have a place where you can go and complain and cause some international reaction if there is cyber attack against your sovereignty. And I believe that more and more countries, particularly in pandemics, realized that this is something which is more and more important. And, the, and Security Council is indeed the place where we normally come and report the conflicts. I see, and, and many, many uh, other countries with whom we've been discussing, see this as, uh, as, a, as an uh, ultimate layer of protection, starting from technology, uh, uh, cyber hygiene of your own people, uh, then your own national law, which protects you. And then you have to have the international legal space, which will finally then help you to maintain uh, your sovereignty also in the cyberspace. I cannot see how this topic could, uh, could fall off the agenda. And of course, Estonia is always remaining, uh, if, if invited, an active participant and advisor to everybody who or anybody who wants to take these issues forward. As I said, we have achieved something. We have achieved that if there is a conventional conflict, then we can take cyber element as a part of this holistic conflict analysis as we take, for example, safety of women and children in the conflict. And, and, and this has been achieved, but we are still quite far away from accepting this as a natural way of life that if somebody comes under massive cyber attack, attack against their sovereignty and they are able to attribute it, that they should be able to come also and report it. And, and this is not yet the natural thing. This, this should be the, uh, the next step to take uh, in Security Council. And as I said, I think this is a good, uh, good uh, I mean, element of peace building because cyber perturbances are the harbinger of the bad things to come. Very often nowadays. Yeah, and of course, the Irish health system, our own health system here in Ireland was the, uh, is still recovering from a, a very, very large cyber attack which took place earlier this year. Um, a question here from um, one of my colleagues in the Institute, um, um, Luke, who wants to know, given Estonia is a global leader in cybersecurity, what advice would you have for countries looking to enhance their cyber resilience? Well, 
First and foremost, I would, uh, I would invite each and every country to become part of those nations who have declared their own intentions in the cyberspace. How can you expect the global world and your, your international partners to kind of help and participate in regulating cyber conflicts, among them cyber conflicts, which take place on your territory? Unless you yourself ha as, have also declared how you see how your own national law and how your own international law applies in the cyberspace. Great academic work, including Tallinn manuals one and two in, uh, in NATO Center of Excellence on cybersecurity, provide ample information for governments uh, to discuss and decide and make such cyber declarations. I led in Estonia the process of arriving at the Estonian cyber declaration. So we have made very clear what is our intent if we come under attack, how we do see that international law allows us to attack. And the more the governments declare their intent, intent in, in these cyber uh, attack situations, the more we have clarity in international legal space. And this is how every nation could contribute, definitely should contribute in my, my understanding. And only then come the, uh, the uh, technological elements, of course, all the public service offer, which during the pandemic rushed online, um, I have really my own worries about it because, you know, unless you build carefully uh, a cyber architecture of uh, government services, that you have a platform of identification where people arrive, identify themselves, only this should open the door for the services. Then the services should be, I mean, offered to people in an encrypted format which normally comes from the fact that, I mean, both ends, the provider and, and, and the demander of this service are signed in and identifiable. There is no anonymity in the system. No data uh, in public service should move in an un uncrypt encrypted format, for example, no emails for heaven's sake. But I know that the world today is full of the rushed online services. They're very good because otherwise there would have been no service during the pandemic. I just visited Kenya, for example. They have court system online, but they themselves admit that it's not encrypted. So they should take a next step and build the platform now even behind. I mean, even after the service has been online already to make sure that people are signing in, identifying themselves and there will be encrypted service software. And I mean, this applies to the most developed nations as well. My, my big worry is that now when these, uh, I mean, rushed and not safe systems start to, I mean, fall prey of the attackers or some other cyber disturbances will happen in these uh, services, people will get discouraged from using the uh, e-services. And however loud noise we here in Estonia might make that with safe architecture, we've been using them for 20 years. It is safe, you just have to think through how you do these things. We might actually uh, see that the reputation of, uh, of digital services could, uh, could fall prey of this uh, rushed uh, service delivery online. And is the, um, is the cybersecurity um, um, challenge, is it breaking down on traditional or historical kind of East West um, uh, Cold War as it were, uh, kind of lines or is it far more diffuse than that? The threat from cybersecurity or the threat to, to our cybersecurity uh, where is it seen as primarily coming from? Is it just a, a, a Cold War reincarnated or is it, uh, is it something a lot more diverse than that? It gets more and more complicated. I mean, first, first and foremost, we must understand that the threats of the Cold War, mainly, for example, nuclear threat. I mean, if uh, nuclear weapons were developed, they were developed under the control of governments, be they, I mean, respecting international law or not respecting international law, but they were, I mean, basically always part of the, of the, of the government portfolio. Nowadays, if we look at the technology development, then if you think even of the 5G or, or other, other systems which we nowadays build, they are built in a much more diffuse way by private sector actors uh, who, uh, who are independent and, and governments don't know how these services are built. There is an intermediate service which should, uh, should actually be uh, our, our trend set, and this is the global position, positioning system, GPS. I'm, I mean, most of the younger generation thinks GPS is a natural resource, but it isn't. It is a complicated technological system which is delivered to the whole world as a service by a democracy 
whose threshold of withholding this service is so high that we've never seen it. I mean, threshold to withhold the service to achieve your political objectives for US is obviously very, very high as a democracy, and they've not done it. And we should think this way about our, uh, our greeds. Um, and we should make sure that uh, we have trusted connectivity. And this is where Estonia has taken initiative now parallel to our Security Council work, together with OECD, its new Secretary General Matthias Korman, together with European Union, uh, uh, with Charles Michel mostly, and also the uh, US uh, government. And we held Tallinn Digital Summit this year, which was, uh, which was contributing to the development of the idea of trusted connectivity as a consensus of a free world. And because you cannot, I mean, build rigid standard, it has to be consensus, which we then all apply. And, and the uh, trademark of this consensus could be the blue dot, uh, blue dot development, which was, was created by Australians, Americans, Japanese, was a little bit not, uh, not so, uh, so much uh, on Woosh for a couple of years uh, during the Trump administration, but is now, uh, is now back on the agenda. And, and it could be the physical element of this, uh, this uh, consensus, which here in Tallinn, we proudly call Tallinn consensus as the Tallinn Digital Summit uh, established that this is indeed something which all the free world realizes it needs to, needs to have. And, and we hope OECD will move forward with the blue dot development as well. This would give us the security of the grid that it is always available, that it does what we want it to do, and it doesn't do anything which, has not, which it has not told us that it does. This is very important. And only then now we come to the less conventional element of cyber risk, which are then all hybrid risks, information misspread, hate, and all these elements. So there are more and more layers with which we need to deal as governments. Just moving it on a little bit, if I may, Madam President. Um, when um, Estonia steps down as, uh, from its membership of the Security Council, and um, you know, at that stage, I think it is only um, in terms of European Union uh, membership of the Security Council, it'll be France uh, and Ireland. Um, obviously, France is in a very particular position as, as, as a, a permanent member of the Security Council. But a question here from one of my colleagues, Stephen Frayne. He said, how would you assess EU coordination at the UN Security Council? And is there a need for greater unity on common foreign and security uh, policy matters on the Security Council? I suppose essentially also, I mean, do the permanent members just go their own way, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, follow their own uh, agenda as it were? Or is there scope and a better prospect and a better possibility of better cohesion uh, by, by the European Union? You know, it's very interesting, but I think it very much depends on our, uh, our uh, ambassadors to UN. And I have to say that in Europe, indeed, we very often agree that we do not have a common uh, foreign and security policy. We probably had a stronger pull, push towards it when uh, Federica Mogherini was, the, uh, was the, uh, the person responsible. He developed our, our understanding on how we could work together and do it in a loose format without actually, I mean, having, uh, having too much legal framework for that. And I don't know, somehow we have felt that this kind of, uh, well, harmonized, but not, not, not totally, I mean, uh, well, let's say united on paper, or united by some kind of regulation or by some kind of agreement. We've, we've seen that it works in UN. I mean, we've, we've seen it already before we joined the UN, our European partners, were those who were very much helping us to understand before we joined the intricacies and the technicalities, and, and some of them also were, were uh, really helpful during the campaign phase. I have to say that uh, in UN, I have never felt, and, and our ambassador and the whole team have never felt that there is not a good cooperation among the EU members. Because you know, there are so many people in Security Council coming from different countries who have a really different value base, that it becomes painfully obvious that whatever our differences might be, finally, we are safe in discussing even them because we're all on the same value base. These liberal democratic values actually carry us through together. And, and I've seen great sticking together, by the way. Um, just a question in relation to um, uh, the... Um 
the, the just the um the, the pandemic uh, the um the covid pandemic obviously your first year in the on the security council was um i think all done um virtually uh unavoidably and i think uh, you took the lead obviously during your council uh, presidency in may of 2020 i think to to really, uh, uh, I suppose, promote and to uh, um, identify more clearly the possibilities of doing uh, working remotely um, as, as a council. But um, just more broadly, how would you evaluate the Security Council's response uh, to COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic, and what lessons can be learned for future pandemics? Or was this really not an issue for the council to be, uh, to be uh, well, obviously it's an issue to be concerned about, but was it a question really of, of, of having the WHO and other such international institutions take the, the major responsibility? Where did the Security Council come into an issue of existential challenge uh, on the global level in relation to the, uh, the pandemic? Well, frankly speaking, I mean, the working method was far less important, but it took us really painfully long to agree on, on any, any press release on, on, on endorsing, endorsing the, the Secretary General's call for ceasefire during the pandemic. I mean, this was not looking good at all for the UN Security Council own reputation, but this was totally independent from the working methods, because the working methods, I mean... <laughs> It's, it's interesting. I mean, since I'm really, I know very well our whole team, which works in the Security Council, and, and then when we get together, they show me their WhatsApps and all, all, all I mean, what they use in order to, to participate, prepare, negotiate, discuss, argue and everything. And our team is young and, and really, really quick, quick reacting. And I think other teams behind the uh, Security Council memberships are, must be quite similar because, uh, I mean, the amount of messaging, the amount of coordination which goes on, and it all goes on electronically, and it all went on electronically also, I mean, before the pandemic hit. I mean, I don't know how familiar you are nowadays, but if the meetings, for example, on the sites of the UN uh, General Assembly are organized, I mean, all teams are in WhatsApp. And I mean, in WhatsApp, they coordinate. My president is five minutes late. My, mine is two minutes early. We have had a mishap. Can you, I mean, postpone the meeting, whatever. I mean, let's do it differently. It's so much electronic and it was so much electronic before the pandemic. So it was only for the leaders, probably, who now first time had to take, I mean, their seat behind their computer and, and come in and, and communicate, which uh, probably was unfamiliar initially. But uh, I really don't think it affected the work of the Security Council that much. It might have ha affected the mental health of our collaborators, I'm afraid, because I know how hard and how long hours they had to sit in front of their computers to make sure that everything finally runs smoothly. And uh, just before we came on, we were just talking about your first year in office in the, on the Security Council was a year, obviously, when when President Trump was still in office and he had a particular view of the of the, the multilateral um, the world. Um, to what extent have you been able to see a difference between year one and year two, uh, particularly in terms of American attitudes and engagement um, in the work of the Security Council? Well, uh, the if you look at the Security Council agenda, it is most of it is extremely technical, and and uh, it's even weird to say that the, but the political element is relatively weak. If you discuss, for example, I don't know UNAMA mission in, in Afghanistan and so on, so on, so on on this side uh, in, on Security Council. Uh, actually, uh, there haven't been big fluctuations. There is indeed a, a more, more felt enthusiasm uh, probably now, but, uh, but it has been a good cooperation also in the, in the last year. We, we really cannot complain. It was, it was, it was, it was fine. And it's, uh, it's, still, it's still good. The new ambassador of the United States puts great emphasis on the, on the African issues, on the women and, and children issues, and I'm particularly grateful for that, being also a global advocate for women and children of UN. Uh, but this again depends very much on personalities. But in Security Council work, uh, uh, US has been a great partner and ally for all these two years. You said that um, in your speech, I think that it could be 2050. Uh, that's 2050 before um, Estonia, you know, turn comes up uh, in terms of membership of uh, the, the the Security Council. Yet again, that's a long, long time away. How will 
how can Estonia, um, I suppose, promote its values and its uh, its priorities, uh, given that you know huge lapse of time, almost thirty years before your number comes up again. It might come up sooner, of course, but assuming it's twenty fifty, it's a long, long time to be out of the top table or away from the top table. Yes, indeed. But our first worry is that we have learned a lot about. Uh, the work and the real life and the working methods of the Security Council, of course, I mean, as, as you know, from our Security Council campaign, uh, Estonian African strategy was born, so we didn't let the exercise to go waste. So similarly, from this Security Council experience, we will probably put together a textbook for all our diplomats, which they can then use. And it doesn't mean, I mean, that you have to be in the Security Council only to use this kind of textbook. I mean, you can work with your partners and allies who are there, who, who are preparing to join. Our closest friend and, and neighbor Latvia is, is, uh, is starting their campaign. Of course, I mean, we are working with them in order to, to help them in their, in their run as well and so on, so on. So we will try to preserve this, what we have to offer this knowledge and experience at the UN and the international and multilateral uh, well, uh, debate uh, as much as we can. Uh, I believe we have much more self-confidence that uh, what we can do really matters and can, can really be important to the global community as well. So I believe it, 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 it takes an effort, but because we consciously take this effort to, uh, to, I mean, keep this impetus, which we have now been able to grow also to the future, to the extent that we call uh, some of our uh, stagiaires in UN and young cooperators in our diplomatic force in UN, the future PGA, because we think that 2053 Estonia will try to become also the president of the General Assembly. So there are a couple of guys who, who need to compete for that job. Uh, as you know, Estonian, well, Estonian diplomatic service is dynamic and young people can get really quite, uh, quite important uh, well, tasks to carry out also in the Security Council work. So these people, they are still below 30. Uh, for them, 2050 is, is perfectly workable idea. And, and becoming a PGA uh, competing for that job might keep them, I mean, involved in UN issues for the next uh, 30 years. That's my objective, at least when I call them the future PGA. Excellent, excellent. There's a question here from Kevin Cardiff, uh, who's a, a member of our institute, the former Secretary General of our Department of Finance. And he says, or he asks, uh, what is the balance uh, for a Security Council member uh, between, um, you know, um, uh, insisting on, on on rights such as women's rights, LGBTQI and uh, children's rights in Afghanistan, for example, and the need to retain external influence and normalize relations with states that don't respect these rights. So how do you find the balance between, you know, um, having these, um, um, you know, concerns, uh, priorities in terms of women's rights, children's rights, and the need also to engage with countries like 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 the current um, regime in, in Afghanistan. It is tricky, but luckily the global toolbox is relatively varied. Uh, what we can use when we are when we are working uh, with uh, these kind of regimes, for example, for. Uh, for a mission like UNAMA, there is relatively low level of conditionality, even less for the missions of Red Cross uh, who keep working in, in Afghanistan. UN women, women, of course, already, for example, try to set conditions, try to insist that their female cooperators must be able to continue working and they were, or, or nobody works, and then they were basically told that then nobody works. But for example, Red Cross also has their female uh, cooperators in Afghanistan still working, and nobody has told them that uh, if, if women don't, if women work, we do not need your services. So there are those bodies whose, um, whose work is very much needed to make sure that, I mean, people are not starving and dying, and that people at least have, can have their basic kind of uh, needs met until we then figure out how we can involve bodies which demand, of course, higher level of conditionality. And, and we Estonian, uh, Estonians here think very much that uh, any kind of uh, relations with the new regime in Afghanistan, uh, which, I mean, go beyond the agreed UNAMA mission or Red Cross cooperation and so on, actually needs to be highly conditional on the right of women to uh, continue participating in the work uh, in Afghanistan society. 
but we cannot really totally, I mean, pack our bags and leave because that would cause even more harm. It is a tightrope to walk, but luckily, I mean, there are different tools in our toolbox. And finally, Kevin, send me an email or something after this meeting. I'm very happy to hear from you. We were colleagues in the European Court of Auditors and, and responsible for a structural reform there together. So I have uh, fond memories of him and Malahai. Okay, very good. Um, um, you mentioned, I think, in your speech that you were, I think, the last uh, member of the Security Council to uh, be in Afghanistan to meet the out uh, that met the outgoing uh, um, administration or regime there. To what extent, I mean, um, did what eventually happened uh, in the summer of this year, did that come as a complete shock? And uh, to what extent did the international community um, um, and, and uh, those participating on the ground in Afghanistan, uh, was it, um, is, is it a major setback uh, for um, the, the general kind of international effort to promote peace and security? Uh, indeed, I was able to discuss with President Ghani and also Abdullah Abdullah, the uh, opposition leader, and, uh, and my understanding was that they, they expected there will be, I think, but they expected that there will be maybe a gradual kind of uh, uh, retraction of the, of, the, of the conflict line for them, but that, that it will happen this quickly and that uh, oh no, the Afghanistan National Army will simply not put up any fight. This, this was probably not expected from them, and I have to say that our partners and allies, we all, we all uh, had an understanding that it will be tough, it will be hard, and as we remember that uh, Taliban didn't show up to Doha discussions any, anymore the, when, when the date of withdrawal of the US forces, which then caused the withdrawal of NATO forces, was agreed. So, so the war was inevitable, that the, that the war will happen, this was kind of accepted by all sides but that it will be so one-sided. This was, uh, was, uh, was not uh, probably uh, uh, predictable for us. How we should relate to it? I mean, first and foremost, I do not think that finally, I mean, how, how would I put it? If Afghanistan National Army itself was not ready to fight for their women and children, it's their wives, their daughters, their sisters then obviously that society had not developed as we have had hoped that it had developed during the last 20 years. And it's not our fault. It was our miscalculation, but it's not our fault. What indeed is our, our, our responsibility now is to make sure that Taliban, which must be today also recognizing already that the Afghan society has changed. I mean, young people do not, I mean, it's not very easy to put them back into this straitjacket now, but probably they are coming to a realization that they need to offer a little bit of a different, more free way. We should be able to kind of be there and, and kind of insist that this happens rather sooner than later. And, and of course, it has to, I mean, be supported by what Afghanistan people themselves dare to say. And we see even today, I mean, nowadays, we see women still, I mean, standing up for their rights. We should make sure that each and every ray of hope is supported, noted, and pointed out to Taliban that they need to build a different regime from which they had, I mean, from which it probably is, uh, is their intention. But I have to say that the initial appointments, ministers, vice ministers, None of them has, uh, has, uh, has given me any hope that things could be better uh, soon. Just uh, maybe as we're coming to the end, uh, I'm just um, curious uh, as to the division of labor in, in Estonia. Uh, obviously, you took the lead on um, and, and led the campaign for the successful membership of the Security Council. And you mentioned your prime minister, your foreign minister also uh, attended and participated in meetings of the council. How does it all how does it all work in Estonia in terms of the division of labor between the office of the president, your office um, and, and the office of the prime minister and foreign minister? Is that an easy relationship or is it is it a, a relationship of practicality or, or how does it actually how, how is it working in the context of the Security Council, for example? Well, in Estonia, uh, the coordinating force of foreign policy is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. This is their, co their coordinating force uh, is demonstrated in, in, I mean, calling 
I mean, the president of the Republic, the prime minister, also the members of the parliament, foreign policy and defense um, uh, committees, and if needed, then also other committees, and telling them that, I mean, we, we have an opening here, we have a plan here, where we think you, as the tool of Estonian foreign policy, might function best. And me, myself, similarly, I mean, we of course discuss and I have my own views and because I did the Security Council campaign and led it, I have probably, uh, I mean, uh, quite a global view about what we could do now, I mean, uh, to forward the Estonian foreign policy and our foreign policy thinking. So I'm an independent thinker on it, but we move together after having discussed uh, these things. And there are very rarely any tensions between any of these actors. Well, sometimes parliament says that I should have coordinated directly with them, whereas we all should remember that it's the ministry who has the coordinating roles, they sometimes forget. So these things could happen. And of course, there are people who relate differently to uh, different initiatives. But all and overall, I would say that uh, we all see ourselves as tools of our foreign policy. And, and when I go, for example, to uh, to, uh, to another country for a meeting, then uh, my question to my ambassador there is that your, I mean, highest level foreign policy tool is here. What are your plans with me now during these days? Which doors you want to open? Where you want me to get in? I mean, to open a way for you. And, and this is how we work here. I don't know whether it's easy to understand, but for I, Irish people should be. I mean, you're not that big nation yourself. Hmm. Well, um, I think uh, that's a, it's a different arrangement, obviously, here. Uh, but I mean, obviously, in your case, it clearly works um, extremely well. As we're coming to the end, maybe just to talk about yourself and your future. Um, you, you're only one day since having been uh, the president, uh, which was yesterday. Um, so you've had um, this extraordinary five years in office, uh, a large part of it. Uh, dedicated to the Security Council, uh, and there are other issues as well, I'm sure. And um, how how do you see yourself? Um, what what do you see yourself as? What do you see as your role being? Uh, you know, in the foreseeable future, and what? Uh, how do you see um, you? How how do you maintain uh, the advantages of the profile uh, that 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 you have um, established over the last five years, and particularly over the last two years on the on the Security Council? How how do you see yourself putting those into continuing effect? Well. And there are various ways. One is that uh, if you look carefully at the international scene, then my predecessor, Thomas Henry Kilves, is still very active in, uh, in, uh, in think tanks, in Munich Security Conference, other conferences in foreign security policy as well. So there is space for more Estonian thinkers on the international scene. I'm quite sure about it. In addition, uh, I have the role of global advocate for women and children appointed by Antonio Gutierrez for two years where I'm concentrating on uh, coordinating our age six bodies on, on, on how we resolve nutrition related issues, uh, uh, maternal mortality issues, and how to make technology serve the, uh, the world, the children better. And there I have a dream that each and every birth globally could be registered uh, over a mobile phone, because nowadays 20% of children born never get registered, how we can vaccinate them, how we can offer them food, how we can offer them schooling, if we do not even know who is born, where to who. And this is totally available nowadays thinking of technology, because mobile phones are, I mean, have relatively high penetration rates, even in the most remote villages, the service doesn't have to be I mean, really, it's not a broadband service. It can be simply done by mobile phone, like, like people pay, for example, or, or use WhatsApp in, in the remote parts of the least developed world. There are some uh, kind of islands of hope where, where I can see digital development is, is, uh, is being thought of as a leapfrogging tool for, for developing nations, trying to get this kind of movement that every baby gets registered. This is something which I would like to bring to, to, this, uh, to this world, if possible, from this uh, global advocate role. It is, of course, a role which doesn't have a budget uh, and, and, uh, and it doesn't have a working program. You can rely uh, only on your own fundraising capability and we're establishing a foundation to, to sustain this work for the next two years. And also, I'm working with Estonian digital and startup sector, which is far bigger than Estonian economy. Just to give you one example, Estonian unicorn, which is Bolt, employs globally and mostly in developing countries, by the way, 300,000 people. Estonian own workforce is 650,000. See, 
this is how big our startup community is and, 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 and our, our digital community. I also plan to work with them both on this. I mean, they are also very much social responsible companies. They are also interested in making sure babies are fed and women get to doctors. So we can join their, their outreach to the world with my more humanitarian outreach. And we will see where all this takes us. We are establishing the President Kaliolaid Foundation to help us to work on these issues. And, uh, and everybody who wants, uh, well, can take contact with my office and, uh, and participate. Well, Madam President, thank you for your time today. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Um, good luck with the future. Um, and good luck with that, uh, the, 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 those ambitions that you just outlined there. Um, the role that you played on the Security Council, that the Stony has played and continues to play, of course, until the end of this year, is something that we obviously follow very, very closely. And we like to think, obviously, that we are kindred spirits in so many ways. We're slightly bigger than you, but not that much bigger than you. Uh, but we very much appreciate you giving the time and sharing your insights with us. I mean, it, it, for us, we are true believers in the multilateral process, uh, just like you are. And we, we, um, we, we have a lot to, to learn from your experience. Uh, and hopefully we will acquit ourselves over the last, the next um, 16 months, uh, as well as uh, Estonia has done over the last, uh, over the period of your time in office on the Security Council. So good luck with the future. Congratulations on all you've achieved in the past. And um, and we look forward to seeing you in Dublin at some stage. Uh, in, re in, in reality, uh, the virtual world is great, uh, but do come and visit us sometime too. Absolutely. I love Dublin. I've, I've once taken a kind of literary excursion through the streets of the Dublin and on, on, the, on the text of James Choice. And it's one of my favorite sightseeing tours. I remember it's still very fondly. So thank you and, uh, and see you sometime in the future. Look forward to that. Thank you very much indeed.